Education policy was in effect, for example, I think in historic resources, actually I think on the next slide might be so. Yeah, I will talk about that in a little bit. We are going to be looking at the why and a lot of times taking that out. Policies also, we've received a, kind of a different direction from the previous community plan. So the policies in here need to be related to land use and they need to be something that planning and zoning or development or um, transportation engineering, road and bridge might be able to implement what's under the division or the Department of Development and Transportation. A lot of times right now there are policies in the plans like people should adhere to wood burning days. And planning and zoning can't really enforce that. We don't have any say in those regulations as planning and zoning and therefore it seems like it may be a little misleading to have it in the plan. Even though it's a great idea but in, as we're going for more of a land use plan, it just doesn't quite fit anymore. This is a, just a, a brief cutout of your policy comparison sheets that were on the table. And this is just to show you what kind of the columns are. So in the first column, we have, this first column is the existing plan recommendations, each spelled out. In the second column is what staff recommends happen to this policy or goal. And in the third column is why staff recommended what they did. So either the action options are we keep it in the area plan, we modify it or add it to the comprehensive master plan if this is a general policy that should apply to everything in the county. We remove it because it is already in the comprehensive master plan, so it's duplicated. We remove it because it's covered by regulations, or maybe there's another reason for removing it. Here is an example of what we mean by duplicated. You can see the words aren't exactly the same. The Conifer Plan talks about preserving significant historic, archaeologic, and paleontologic resources for their association with events or persons, their distinct characteristics, or the scientific data provided. The Comprehensive Master Plan still talks about preserving significant resources, historic resources, but it has slightly different words. Preserve, reuse, rehabilitate, or enhance. And it talks about providing links to county's heritage and recognizing social and economic significance. While those are not exactly the same words, staff feels that the intent here is covered here because it still talks about preserving those historic resources. Also to let you know, we did do a definition of historic resources so that it does include archaeologic, paleontological, and cultural resources, because those were things, different things mentioned in different community plans. So we lumped them all together so we wouldn't have to say that all every time, because it's quite a lot. Here's an example of what I was talking about with why not having the why of the policy in here. The, for the association with the events or persons, distinct characteristics or scientific data provided. That is something that is more why you have the policy. And we are going towards, okay, what is the intent of the policy? And are we achieving the same outcome? The why portion doesn't really change the desired outcome of preserving historic resources. And so, therefore, we feel the language in the comprehensive master plan is appropriate to take kind of take that place. <clears throat> so the process that staff went through in creating these is we put in all of the existing plan policies. Then we looked at them and we reviewed it and said, is there already an existing thought policy in the comprehensive master plan? Does it align with what is in the community plan? And then if it isn't, then we retain those policies. If it is duplicated, then we are suggesting that they be removed. 
We also have updated regulations since the last community plan was done. And therefore, there may be regulations that apply now that may not have applied in 2003 when this plan was updated the last time. Additionally, like I said, there may be some policies that aren't really relevant to land use, and, or there may be policies that development and transportation doesn't really have any control over. Okay, so this is where we're going to get started. I am going to first pause and ask if there's any questions, and then I'll go over how to use the clickers, because that's what we're going to start in doing next. Any questions at this point? What happens after today? After tonight, we will go back and we'll take the, well, we'll take the responses we used tonight, but people also have a chance if we're not going to go through all the policies. So please look at these charts and see if you agree with staff's recommendation or if you do not. We'll take that information into account, and then we will determine which policies go forward into our draft plan. So we'll use the information tonight and any other comments that we get. I say if you can get us the information by our next meeting, which is September 25th, then that would be great. So it gives quite a bit of time. And just to let you know, we'll, be, we'll have these sheets for every chapter in the, in the community plan. We may not have meetings on all of them. We may just put some of them out there to the public and ask if there are any comments on them. We're trying to, uh, that's a great segue into our next exercise. When I looked at all the policies in these two chapters, there was no way that we would be able to get through them all tonight. There's a lot of policies in each. So what I did was I looked back at the kickoff meeting notes and what people had a lot of interest in. And it seems that lighting was mentioned a lot and also preserving historic resources was mentioned quite a few times. Therefore, what I'm going to do tonight is concentrate more on the goals of each chapter and then also specifically the lighting policies. But I won't be going into all of the policies that are in your handouts. Okay, so for the clickers, they're pretty easy to use. What are they? Are there more clickers? Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. These <laughs> <laughs> need clickers. So I'm going to go just real quick to this next slide so it's a little easier to explain. Each slide will have a response. First I'm going to go through the question and the comparison, what staff did. And then I'll be asking you whether you agree. And the numbers correlate with the numbers on your keypad. Just to let you know these are completely anonymous. We can't track back who voted which way. These are completely anonymous and so you don't have to worry about somebody else seeing who you are and disagreeing or I don't know. So the numbers you want to, depending on which you, which you feel, you'll press number one, two, or three on your keypads. One, two, three. So the top three. And I'm trying to think, so that's, and you can, until the poll closes, you can change your mind and press different numbers. It will register whatever your last click was. So if you press one and then you're like, oh no, wait, um, I see something that needs a little work. I mean, I want to press three. You can do that until the poll closes, and I'll announce when that closes. There's not a set time period. It's whatever I determine. I think that's all about that. It's pretty simple. You don't have to press an enter or anything, just the number. Any questions on how to use these? No, but I mean, what does yes mean? Um, yes means that you agree with staff's assessment. No means you don't agree, you just don't agree with it all together. Three is maybe we just need to work on a few of the details with it. How about who got comments for number three? I would, well that's after, if I see that there are comments with number three, then I'm going to ask what the comments are and Annalise is going to be taking notes on you how we might get to the details means I have a comment I want to right. tell you. Yes. Okay. Okay. So first I'm going to start with air, light, or odor, and noise. 
goals. The first goal in the Confort Plan is protect and improve air quality. There are three, well, two policies in the plan that, in the Comprehensive Master Plan, that staff felt were very comparable to protect and improve air quality. One is encourage the effective management of air quality and the impacts of light, odor, and noise. And then the other is promote the protection of air quality. Also, just wanted to have a note the language is slightly different. It may not seem quite as strong. We don't also have necessarily improve in the comprehensive master plan because that's not really a function of planning and zoning to improve air quality. We can make sure if there's a new business that they don't further de degrade air quality, but it's not our function to improve air quality. It's more either Jefferson County Public Health or the Colorado State Department of Health and Environment. So that was why improve is not a statement in one of those. Everybody? I have another question. Yeah. So the language up there on the screen, I may be wrong, but I was expecting it to match the sheet language. It I don't know if I see it. Like the CMP language on the sheet here? Yes. Oh, OK. I just read the first line. And then I stopped where I said page 49. I thought maybe oh, you might have so referred to that. Oh, yeah. But no, I see. So, I see yeah, that. I should say this has a little more detail on it because it actually shows you where in the comprehensive master plan it's located in case you wanted to look it up in the document. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. And like it. Like she just pointed out, if you can't remember what it said and you need to look at it a little bit more, it is in all your sheets. So if you wanted to start responding, you may. Yes, no, or need to work on details. How many clickers do we have out there? Do you both have clickers? Yes. Okay. So we should. So is the number supposed to hold or disappear on the it, clicker? It disappears. You press it and it disappears right away. So there's, if you're unsure what like you that. press, just press it again. Okay. If you've got short-term memory loss, <laughs> <laughs> you can keep pressing it until until the polling closes. And it looks like so far eight people have responded. Just one right now. Okay. I will go over two next. Okay, we have ten responses. We're close. Unless I miscount. How many other eleven? Has has everybody responded? Is there anyone who hasn't responded? Oh yay, okay. Okay, so there are some people out there who feel we need to work on the details. So, what are the comments on this, and what, what do we need to look at as far as revising this? No point in saying three if you're not going to speak up. <laughs> it seems like generalizing the whole area starts to ignore specific needs of a, of a well, small region. Incorporated versus unincorporated versus incorporated areas. There are many things you can do. There are some things you can do in one and not in the other. So I would say it's not county-wide. It's a function of are you incorporated versus are you unincorporated would be a well, dominant thing that would have to be considered. 
And this only applies to, the comprehensive master plan only applies to unincorporated areas. So Lakewood, oh. Wheat Ridge. How many are in Jefferson County? So they can. How many incorporated yeah. areas? Yeah. There are, there's Wheat Ridge, Lakewood, Westminster, Superior, Littleton, Morrison, Golden, Edgewater, Mountain View, Lakeside. Maybe think of anything else that I might be missing? So I think there are 10 incorporated areas in Jefferson County. All in the Flatlands. Yes. The no, there are no incorporated areas in the mountains. Evergreen, Conifer, Genesee, Golden Gate Canyon area, those are all unincorporated. So if there are items about air quality that you feel are important, like there, there is a policy in air light odor and noise that talks about air inversions. That is something that's more of a specific policy to the area. And let me see, I want to say we thought we should keep it or somehow modify it, but let me make sure. I was actually not going to talk about that. Yeah, there's, so on page four of the air light odor and noise, there's a couple of policies that to me seemed more specific to the area. Number four talks about the location, design, and density of development should be sensitive to air currents and inversions in the area to avoid pollution. That seems like something that's more specific to mountain areas, and therefore it seemed like it should be kept in this specific plan. The, so far, the other mountain plans that we've done haven't mentioned this issue, so it may even be something that is more specific to Conifer than even some of our other mountain areas. Also, there um, talks about if applicable sensory impact report, including air current analysis, is a way of determining that possible pollution. And that's not something that's covered in our comprehensive master plan. And it seems very related to the air inversion, so that was something we were recommending be kept in the plan. So if there are things like that that are specific to the area, we would be interested in keeping those maybe as policies. So think about that. You have, you have a while, so if you don't know of anything specific right now, but as you think about it over like the next month, what's that? It takes a little study. Yeah. It does. Do you have something in there about night skies, anything about jake breaks, things like that? We do. Let's see. I don't know that we have any. I'm trying to remember if we have something about jake breaks. But we do. We're going to be talking about the lighting policy in each one of them, so we'll be going through that. Okay. And the comprehensive master plan does talk about dark skies and dark sky policies. And I know that noise... I might not be seeing that about noise, so that might be something that may be a comment to specifically make for the area. You know, because jake breaks aren't such a problem in, in the flatlands, but mm -hmm. yeah. jake breaks on the trucks. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is a, a good point. So, maybe Alice could pick that up on the. Or are you taking notes on different? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I guess we should have brought two. Because have stickies. Any other comments on that one? Okay, we're gonna move on. The second goal in air, light, odor, and noise that is currently in the conifer plan is minimize light, odor, and noise pollution in the plan area. In this one, we have two policies that seemed like they were comparable. One was almost duplicative. There's one that talks about minimize light, odor, and noise pollution. So we felt that that one was covered. So, time for the keypads again. Do you agree? Yes. One, yes, it is covered. No, it is not covered. And three, we need to work on details. Wow, a 
okay, we have 12 responses now. Did you guys get key, key pads? Okay. Yes, just okay. Seven. So then we probably have 13 responses now. Uh -huh. Okay, so there is still concern that we need to work on some of the details. What were, what are some of the concerns about the details of that? Well, I guess now that we passed the marijuana legalization law, what about marijuana odors? That's something that's, what, does it, does it define odors and maybe new odors appear in the scheme of things? Well, maybe we, we, we introduced them legalization of marijuana, so now we have marijuana odors and smoking and the actual grow houses and mm -hmm. what have you and, and so is that, how do you deal with what's defined as an odor? Mm -hmm. Well, and there's also two issues there. One, planning and zoning doesn't really deal with. If somebody is out there smoking privately, smoking marijuana or smoking a cigarette, that is not something that planning and zoning has any enforcement capacity over. However, as far as grow operations or dispensaries, currently Jefferson County does not allow any grow any um, dispensaries. We are also looking at not whether or not we are allow, going to allow any of the grow operations, but right now we currently do not. So that would that could be something that's more of a land use issue, and there could be a policy in the plan maybe that talks about either dispensaries or grow operations and that those should not be allowed in this area. And then, so what's defined as noise? Is this gunfire noise? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Noise is noise. I mean, but when I'm talking, that's noise. So we do have certain standards as far so as... any time that you cannot do gunfire between six before 6 a.m. and after midnight or something? The sheriff's office does have a noise ordinance, and they have certain hours where you can't do certain activities that are above a certain decibel. So I believe for residential areas, I think it's 65 decibels during the day, and then 60 decibels in at, from like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. That is something that the sheriff's office controls and enforces. However, I think that we did have some language in the plan that talked about noises that may not necessarily be over that threshold, but because you're in the mountains, there are, there's kind of a different underlying background noise, and therefore there could be some noises that could still be annoying to people living up in the mountains where in the plains it might be covered up by background noise. And I thought there was also a policy that talked about noises that are that don't exceed it but are still annoying. Well up here you can hear somebody's radio plan easily half right. a mile away. Mm -hmm. And some and depending where they are, if they're up high and you're down low, I mean it's it's incredibly how far Mm -hmm. practically listen to somebody's conversation a quarter of a mile away when it's quiet. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. noise <clears throat> is the sense of place. It's like, are you in an area of silence and mm -hmm. somebody's radio playing is, affects dozens or hundreds of people. And, yeah. Or they're playing drums or something, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it's, it's uh, incredibly overwhelming in a very silent area, yeah. and that's what is one of the most wonderful things up here is sometimes you can have almost complete silence. And what... And it's people are silent seekers up here don't interact with the noisy people very well. <laughs> and while that is not... The, the issue with noise is that planning and zoning can't regulate somebody's radio blaring. That's not somebody that's changing their land use. We could have a silent area of silence just like we have a dark sky. If we go towards a dark sky, you mm -hmm. could say, this is an area of silence, and we go towards silence to increase the degree of silence, which would be increasingly precious value in our civilization. But all that seems outside the scope of these two items. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I know, but there's a noise section back down mm -hmm. in here that and is more detailed. Okay, but, I, I think that But there... if we seek a dark sky, why can't we seek... Silence. 
because dark sky is actually regulated or it can be enforced by planning and zoning enforcement officers. We have regulations regarding light in our zoning resolution. However, we do not have regulations in our zoning resolution regarding noise. We defer that to the sheriff's department. We can have some intent language and we can have some language explaining. I think in the, I'll have to look, in the North Mountains plan, I think they had some special language just for North Mountains saying this community enjoys and appreciates the, the quietness of the area. And so I can look and see what the North Mountains had and see if there might be a policy that could be added that would be more specific to the mountain conifer area. But we would not, I don't foresee us being able to do a silent area because that would be something where we could not enforce that. It would have to be enforced by the Sheriff's Office. So it would probably be something that have, would have to go to the Sheriff's Office, get updated in their ordinances, and go to the Board of County Commissioners. I, I called the sheriff uh, uh, about a neighbor shooting in the bank, and the sheriff came out and he said, you can shoot on your own property anytime you want to, and we can do it, not do anything about it. He, uh, thank God he's curtailed it somewhat, but gunfire to me means danger. Mm -hmm. But the sheriff can't do a damn thing about it. And planning and zoning can't either. Yeah. Yes. Doesn't the county have no shoot zones? I've seen the map. We have firearm discharge prohibition areas, and those right. are also enforced by the sheriff's office. Right, but I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. Well, They're, on your own property, I'm talking about that. Even on your own property, you shoot in the way. Even on your own property, there are zones in the county where you're not allowed to use a gun, period, for, for Target the sheriff don't know anything about it down the Foxton Road. <laughs> well, all the, the, all the, the time, fire. down Foxton Road, most of that area, we get Conifer Meadows and every year's a young shoot zone. No, no, not really. No, no, I'm, at least as far as the county's concerned. As far as the county's concerned. The sheriff, as far as the sheriff's concerned, you can shoot on your own property any time you want to. As long as you shoot into a bank, it's not shooting into, into a bean, a berm or something. Yeah. Well, I, I would have to look into that one because I thought there was a firearm discharge prohibition area where you could not there's, there's shoot the uh, shoot firearms um, outside of that area. I thought it was we could as long as you were shooting into a backstop or something. Do you think maybe con for a minute? Well, I would be honest. Well. All I'm saying is there is a map. The county has a map somewhere on their website, and, and it shows the no discharge zones, and the sheriff may be wrong. And, and it's it's happened before. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying that. Yeah. I, looked in, you know, I looked into this on another issue once that I was running about. And I can also look into that. I can look at that map and make a map. I have our GIS guys make a map so that we can, I can bring it to another meeting so you can see where those are. And yeah. I don't know if that's planning. I don't know what the part, you know, what part of the Jefferson County government maintains that map, created that map. I don't know if it's planning or it's the sheriff's department. Yeah, yeah, it was the sheriff's department. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, the staff recommendation is to remove the duplicate remove it because it's duplicated in the CMP and what is in the CMP is this encourage the effective management. I don't think that's strong enough that that's the intent to be honest. Um, the CMP or the 285 corridor plan is specifically minimize light odor and noise pollution in the area and that's what all of the uh, people in this, uh, I think residents in this area are actually wanting to, to see kind of enforced versus you know this kind of manage the effect that seems like a nebulous who knows what you're going to get and if you have a complaint about what's going to go on in some particular zoned area, you, you may be just overlooked because, you know, they would consider it to be effectively managing it. Mm -hmm. There's also a policy in the Comprehensive Master Plan that does say minimize light, odor, and noise pollution, specifically. In the CMP? Yeah. Do we have the CMP plan here or not? I did not actually bring it. Okay. No. It's, it's, it's really, I think you brought it. It's, it's only yeah. But it does, yeah, it does show it in here under the sensory impact aspects element. 
it does talk about minimizing light, odor, and noise pollution. Is this on the line, too? Well, I'm just trying to figure out whether the they're saying is. this is essentially duplicated or it's exactly duplicated. If it's exactly duplicated, then obviously you can remove it. But if it's saying, like, we can just substitute it, I'm not sure that's a valid substitution. The only thing that isn't duplicated is in the plan area. In the plan area. Yeah. So in the CMP, the CMP applies to all of Jefferson County because okay. those are general policies that apply, uh, should apply everywhere. I mean, minimizing light, odor, and noise is not just a mountains issue. It's okay. an everywhere in Jefferson County issue. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, then we're going to move on. Now, like I said at the beginning, there are a lot of other policies, vehicle emissions, air quality, odor and noise, but specifically tonight I was going to ask questions about the light policies because those are, that was the issue that came up the most when we had our kickoff meeting. And in light of time, we don't really have time to go through all of them tonight, but again, please submit any of your comments that you might have on the rest of them. Oh, sorry. On page four of seven is where we're starting now. So the policy specifically says encourage lighting practices and systems that minimize glare, light trespass, and light pollution, and conserve energy and resources while maintaining nighttime safety and security and nighttime visual environment. Consideration should be given to the time required for the human eye to adapt to large differences in light levels. Changing, changes in light levels should be minimized. For example, bright service station canopy to dark streets. There were four policies in the comprehensive master plan that we felt met the intent of that language. Again, this might not be exactly the same, but overall we're looking at what the intent and what the outcome of this would be. So there is a policy that talks about encouraging efficient use of lighting to reduce adverse light impacts. So there's efficient use of light, we felt would uh, um, relate to conserving energy, and it talks about conserving energy right here, light conserve energy. Reduce adverse light impacts. That is a more general way of talking about light trespass and light pollution. And it does talk about while providing for public safety and security. And it talks about safety and security over there. And this goes on to talk about productivity, utility, enjoyment, and commerce. There is a specific policy that says discourage abrupt changes in light levels. Like, for example, it even gives the same example of the bright service station canopies. And there is also a policy that talks about promoting light color design and installation that protect the nighttime environment while providing for public safety. And that is something that, again, goes back to light trespass, glare, and pollution by having the appropriate color design and installation of these lights that decreases then light trespass, pollution, etc. Dark sky practices should be evaluated as regulations are updated. We have, currently also, we have lighting regulations in our zoning resolution. So anybody that comes in will have to meet certain lighting standards. And I actually have that in a future slide. So we do have our regulations that also talk about glare, light trespass, and light pollution. But when those regulations are updated, we're saying we should look at dark sky practices and see how those might be able to incorporate, be incorporated to make it even better. Heather, I have a question. Yes. Regarding the, like if there's something as you're doing these plans, if there's mm -hmm. something in one of the community plans that maybe is written or some people think it's written better than what's already in the mm -hmm. comprehensive master plan, mm -hmm. are you looking at changing the comp plan too? There is the option that we is can that modify the comprehensive master plan. Okay. Yep. And that's also another, when you get to, hey, maybe we need to look at the details, we might, instead of putting a specific policy in the conifer plan, we might be able to revise the comprehensive master plan to make it better for the entire county. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out. 
So staff in this case is recommending that it be deleted because we think that it's duplicated by those policies. So what do you guys think? Yes, do you agree? No, or we need to work on some details. Well, we don't have the problem of life, in my opinion, up here. Uh, well, not yet, yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of people, the concern is that they want to keep it that way. And they want to make sure that the, that the regulations and the zoning and any rezonings that occur keep it that way and don't increase that light pollution. How can the county uh, say how we really feel up here? You're generalizing mm -hmm. too much. I Well, and that's one thing that I guess is the nature of the job. We have to take into account what everybody's different opinions are and see so far what I've heard is that people like having low lighting levels. Now, if I hear from somebody that they love having everything brightly lit, then we probably need you to look at things. You might. Closer to a city area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, yeah, and there's also that balance, which is why some of the policies talk about we want to reduce that light glare and light pollution, but we still want to make sure that we provide for the safety and security of people. And there are different ways to do that. So in our lighting standards, for example, in the zoning resolution, we talk about not allowing commercial floodlights because we think there are other ways that commercial businesses could provide security for their business rather than a commercial floodlight. They could do a downcast light over certain areas. They could maybe put their lights on a sensor so that as motion is detected, the lights go on and off instead of having them on all the time. So we feel in our regulations, we have written it so that certain things are not allowed, but you're still allowed to have some lighting. And there's always that balancing act. Okay, so we have all the votes. Need to work out details and no. Got our first no. So somebody just completely doesn't agree with it, and that's fine. Are there, and there's some details, so I don't know if there's any way to change the person's mind from no to if we modified some of the policies, maybe by something that the people that voted, we need to work on some details. Who wants to work on details? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Well, I, mine was more a question, and, and what it bothers me there, the, the words light trespass and light pollution are very strong words. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's that the plan, you don't want that kind of strong language in the plan. And that may be kind of your, the policy or the way a plan works. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like having those strong words in there. And so that's where my apprehension, um, I think I agree with it overall, that I like the strength of those words, but I also recognize that maybe they don't really belong in the master plan. Well. Truthfully, I don't know that they don't belong in the master plan. So that could be a comment that we need to look yeah. into strengthening those words. But um, like I was saying, we could change the policy in the comprehensive master plan maybe to say, encourage the efficient use of lighting to reduce, to minimize glare, light trespass, and light pollution instead of reduce adverse light impacts. I think that we were trying to find a way when we wrote this initially, to kind of generalize all of that. But it emasculates for us. <laughs> and, you know, I was not the no vote, but I almost have to attend, um, you know, agree with Grace when she said, you know, it almost should be a lot stronger up here than in the city. So maybe there should be something in the... Um, in the community plan, in our, our plan, that really talks more strongly about lighting. Because I think it is a huge issue up here. When you've got hills, I know when the Safeway first went in, and the gas station lights went on, mm -hmm. um, there were people miles away that could see that because of the way the hills and the mountains and everything are. And so it makes a lot of difference up here where it 
doesn't as much in the city. So I'm, I'm almost le leaning towards no and having something for the community. Okay. I, I found, in my experience dealing with uh, commercial property up here, where the county just keeps saying, oh, that's okay, they're in compliance now. Mm -hmm. And they just slough over everything and nothing is ever done. And, then, and so I have to agree that probably it should be stronger wording. So then maybe our standards that we have right now in our zoning resolution might not be as stringent as you would like. Right. And maybe in this area we might need to have a recommendation that we have different or more enhanced lighting standards mm -hmm. than even the zoning resolution. So I'm going to change my vote. Okay. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't change it now. <laughs> okay. But we are writing down your comments. Okay. And I do have a record that there are people that feel that this needs to be worked on or that they don't agree that that is covered and that maybe we should keep something in the community plan. The other thing that, I mean, I agree with what has been said, but the other reason why I said, um, you know, I have issues with it is that new development, because, it, you know, could putting in some new light fixture count as new development on an existing structure? I think, hmm, I no, so that was a little too vague for me that, you know, it, it was too open to interpretation yeah. um, on that one. And one of the tricky things about that is one of the, one of the issues with when somebody rezones is, and when these policies apply is that it only really applies to when somebody comes in and wants to do new development. It doesn't apply to existing development. The, the nature of the plan is that way. But we could definitely have more stringent standards for when there is new development. Because, I mean, I would have an issue for, say, this building, mm -hmm. adding in new floodlights or, you know, whatever. I think. So it's not just new development. It's so it's new lighting. New lighting. You know, I'll have to look into that a little bit more and see if that's even something that we can enforce. Because I'm not sure what, when somebody might be pushed into our zoning regulation standards and when they might not be. Because I know that, like, if they, if on the church they replaced one of their bulbs, then we don't, we, won't, we wouldn't necessarily know about that and we might not be able to say, oh, you changed your light to the wrong kind of bulb. So. But if they remodel and increase the footprint or something like that, it might it would be through the building department. Yeah. Yeah. But coming, I'm with IREA, you know, our lights and stuff like that, or along the roads and stuff like that, you're coming, when a customer comes to us and says, hey, we want a yard light, there's no compliance except for we have to go with the dark sky, we have to have downcast lights. That's our policy and it's the one we have to follow with LED lighting now. Um, you know, we're not going to go through planning and zoning or anything like that. I mean, the customer wants it, we're going to comply to the wish, but yet we're going to comply with the dark sky uh, limits, that, you know, the regulation on that. Um, from my IRA standpoint, um, it's effective what's going on. I mean, we have to comply with certain things already. It's already in the government, you know, regulations and things like that. But just want to let everybody know. I mean, yard lights, um, uh, street lights, and stuff like that. We have a different type of setup than you would see on a building or anything like that. So I don't know if there's going to be any type of regulation on that or not in this community plan. Or yeah. Like that. So I would probably have to look at our zoning resolution. I I can't remember what exactly it says about streetlights. I want to say they might be exempt, okay. but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, if we're putting streetlights in at a corner intersection like that, we have 23 foot poles mm -hmm. or 30 foot poles. We're not like what CDOT has with the sodium where you have the orange, we have the downcast bright white light, and it looks really different than you'll see anyplace else. And, and also, that is a limitation of this plan. This plan does not get put into effect when somebody is pulling a building permit. Um, when, if somebody has to rezone and then pull a building permit, we can make them adhere to strain, more stringent standards. But if they are just pulling a building permit and putting up some new lights, the plow policies in this plan would not apply. Okay. Heather? Well, yes? Is it that they wouldn't apply or just that you, there's no way for you to know that information and have it enforced? They don't apply. Okay. So this... The, the policies in this plan only apply when somebody wants to change 
what they're allowed to do with their zoning. So it only applies for rezoning, special use, and site approval cases. Lighting policy two. All illumination installations should follow state and county lighting standards and regulations or meet standards such as the Illuminating Engineer Society, Engineering Society of North America. One of the things that we've been trying to remove from a lot of our community plans is when something says you should comply with our regulations because we feel that, well, yes, people should comply with all of our regulations, not just necessarily maybe this one, but they should comply with all of Jefferson County's regulations. So in a way, we feel that that is redundant with what our regulations already are. We already, people really should follow county lighting standards. We have those standards. If they come in, we will require them to follow those standards. So we felt that this policy could be removed. Do you agree? Do you keep ads out? Do you agree, disagree, or need to work on details? everyone responded that wants to respond? We have 11 people that have responded and we've typically gotten 13. And if you don't want to respond to a certain question, I should have said this, you don't have to respond you to every question. You have number four, but you don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, what don't you understand about the question? I'll try to clarify. I don't want to vote on this one. Okay. I don't understand. Okay, so there are people that don't agree, and that maybe we need to work on details. Let's discuss. What are some of the, so it sounds like there might be probably at least one person that thinks, maybe thinks that this should be retained in the community plan? I personally think it needs to be retained in the community plan simply because you're asking people to comply with all of JEFCO rules and policies. And like we've been discussing, there's a different level of needing to comply up here. So clearly stating this needs to be adhered to, I think is desirable. Okay. So not then, minimizing that they don't need to comply with all the other things, mm -hmm. but like we've been saying, the noise, the light, the mm -hmm. air pollution in this rural setting truly is an issue and you will be required to comply with it. I guess the question is, was it, over. was it put in there for a reason because there were problems with it before when we were just left to ambiguity that people would generally follow what should be, they should be following anyway? And by stripping it out, are we going back to not making it in their face? Okay. So perhaps there could be a way to reword it. One of the things that can happen when somebody comes in to rezone they can request for a planned development zone district where they get to write their own standards. Which means they could say, we want lighting standards that are lesser than what's in the zoning resolution. So I wonder if maybe a better way to address it might be to say, in the conifer area, any rezonings should not be allowed to have a lesser standard than what our zoning resolution is. And that, that would, I guess, make me feel a little bit better, too. So I don't know if that would address your It would well. address it because my concern is if we drop it, mm -hmm. which is what's proposed, but like just eliminate it, mm -hmm. to me that says that wording that was put in there for a reason is no longer necessary. And we're here talking about our concerns and that they are necessary. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of saying it can't drop below what current is. Okay. 
Yeah. I like your suggestion too, because if they they can request that they don't have to follow any of the things. Why are we going through all this if everyone's going to be able to get out of them? Well, and, and typically what we say is if you're doing a plan development and where you write your own standards, you have to exceed the standards. But we have seen some where they're actually proposing things that are less than their standards. Typically, we say we don't like that, but people can always then go to the board, to the planning commission, the board of county commissioners, and they make they might make different decisions. And so this, if there is this policy, it might give staff a little extra oomph to say, look, you shouldn't even, you shouldn't go below the standard. I, I personally believe in having it clearly stated we've gone through an, an issue that went up against the commissioners mm -hmm. and we pulled out the corridor plan and ultimately it's what saved development from happening in our meadow. So I like the word staying in there. Okay. So I like the new proposal that yeah. you guys have been discussing, but I still don't like the word should. I mean, if you, in, in your scenario that you just posed, the person comes in and you say, no, you really shouldn't do that. that. And if I were that person who really wanted it, I would say, but I can. It's and not a should. Yeah. It's a can or I can't. And one of, <laughs> one of the issues with our community plans and comprehensive master plan that by nature of it, by state statute, these plans are all recommendations and therefore based on legal advice from our attorney, we can't have musts and require in our community plans or comprehensive master plans. They have to be shoulds or we encourage you to do this. That's kind of the nature of this plan. We can put musts and shalls in our regulations, but because this document is advisory only, and I didn't go through that at the beginning, but this document is an advisory document, and therefore we can't really put in musts <coughs> or requires. Okay. I like should. Should have been a litigious person. <laughs> Light policy three. Here we're going to talk about what our standards are right now. So currently there is a policy that says all exterior light fixtures, including street lights, should be correctly installed, full cutoff or shielded fixtures to present, prevent glare, direct glare and or light trespass. Our lighting standards currently in the zoning resolution, these are the regulations that people have to follow. Now, like we were talking, if somebody wants to do a plan development, they might be able to get away with not doing this, but we, we typically say these are your minimum standards for plan developments. They say that all the following lamps shall be full cut off fixtures unless otherwise specified in this section. So residential uses, and we do have in our lighting standards a difference between mountains and plains. Residential uses in the mountains, all lamps over 1,750 lumens, which I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what that would relate to. Oh, approximately 100 watts. Look, it says in my regulations. <laughs> um, that is the requirement for residential uses and all other uses, so any institutional like churches or schools or uh, all other uses, commercial, industrial, retail, office, they would all have to be full cutoff fixtures. So I guess the question is, do you guys feel that our regulations cover that or are there things in that that need to be maybe tweaked in the we staff felt that our regulations addressed it. So, do you agree that staff that the regulations currently address it and it can go away? Do you not agree and want to keep it in, or maybe there are some details that we can work out? Or remember that we are talking about adding that other policy. Maybe your comment would be, if we added that other policy, we'd be okay with this. Yeah, that's something that actually we have. It must. <coughs> Wait, why? Is this the yeah. Yeah, we have to here. Okay. So we 
have quite a few people who think that we need to work on some details. Excuse me. What are the details? I don't like that statement in below the box. It says shielding shall not be required for lamps which accent entrance ways, art, water features, fountains. That sounds like a huge loophole. Okay. I just that that sentence. And it says, yeah, provided the light is concealed and narrowly focused. I, it, it just smells of loophole to me. <laughs> and so I, I would like to see that modified, clarified, or something that it doesn't allow somebody to put up a big glaring entryway light. Okay. Yeah. I think light trespass specifically needs to be added back in somehow. Okay. Because, uh, you know, we, we don't live on flat property, so um, cut-off lights don't necessarily minimize the glare to adjacent properties. Okay. Okay. I mean, even if it said something along the lines like shield should cut, should minimize light trespass to adjacent properties, I think covers what you're trying to say. Just based on proximity of properties and elevation, it should simply having a shield on it doesn't mean it's going to shield from the other property based on those elevations. So the light trespass is verbiage it should go back in. Okay, one thing that I'm just trying to look back at, I think we may have talked about perhaps adding it back into a different policy, the light trespass, so I don't know if that would, I don't know if that would satisfy us, but we did talk about adding back light trespass, light pollution, and glare, and adding that actually into our comprehensive master plan. Yeah? What is the definition of light trespass? Well, in the conifer plan, Let's see, it was actually defined because it's a bold and italic word. <laughs> For a reason. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> it's we defined. Don't like it. <laughs> actually, my question is a little bit. I mean, I, I, I know what the word term implies. I guess what I'm implying is I was like trespass. One person would say that bothers me, another person would say it doesn't. How do you measure it? That's right. How do you quantify, quantify it? How do you quantify it? You have it? a light trespass meter. Yes. We, we have light meters. Um, so when we have a certain standard where you have to meet certain, certain lumens at the property line in our regulations. And it's, whenever anybody does a commercial development, they have to give us a lighting plan that shows us where all the light fixtures are going to be located and what kind of illumination levels that light will put off. And then, so they have then little numbers all over this plan and they basically have to show us that at the property line there is not any light that would be led read by a light meter. Does that include straight up? I don't, I don't think we allow straight up lights, except well, no, I mean, there is that caveat that might get some people out of straight up lights for landscaping. I don't know the I, I, I don't know the answer to these questions why I'm asking. Lights that could bother a helicopter that's not been flying at night time. And I, that's an FAA thing, I know. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that we have something. I don't have the entire zoning resolution, but I believe we have something in there that says that lights cannot interfere with any any air, airplanes. Oh, yeah, and we have. Yeah, any or any incident or reflected light that may be confused or construed as traffic control device. Uh, no strobe lights, search lights, high intensity beams. Oh, okay. That's in our regulation that so, people can't do that. Heather, I'm confused about how the regulations work and how this document works in overall. Because you said that you were thinking in somewhere else it was going to put the light trespass back in. Mm -hmm. And so let's say if it didn't say light trespass here, mm -hmm. would it say see such and such? You know, line this page that for further definition. I mean, does it all sort of wrap back on itself like that? If we don't put it here, mm -hmm. so if we don't put it here, we do have an air, light, and odor and noise chapter and a sensory aspects chapter in our comprehensive master plan. 
this plan is going to become a part of that comprehensive master plan, and therefore all of those policies in the comprehensive master plan apply when somebody comes in to do a development. So if we change the language in the comprehensive master plan to talk about light trespass, then that would cover conifer, it would cover evergreen, it would cover Golden Gate Canyon, it would cover South Jeffco where South West Plaza is, it would cover everywhere. So basically, if you put it in the CMP, we don't need to add it back here is what you're saying. Correct. Now, my understanding is if it is in here, this, the local area plans kind of supersede the CMP, as I recall. If they have more specific policies, right. if the policy is pretty much the same, then the comprehensive master plan applies. Gotcha. So that's why we're looking for, if you think it should be in the conifer plan, we're wondering why it isn't. If we feel it's already covered in the comprehensive master plan, why do you feel it's not covered in there? Uh -huh. And what are the specific things related to conifer that need to be in there? Because that's what we really want to get to with the conifer plan, is what is really unique, important to residents of conifer, and what is specific to the conifer area. We'll move on to the next one, lighting policy four. Discourage internally eliminated signs, commercial floodlights, search lights, blinking, flashing, or changing intensity lights, with the exception of time and temperature and temporary holiday displays. So this was kind of a mix. We felt that the first part was not addressed anywhere, either in our comprehensive master plan or in our regulations. So we felt that the first part of the sentence should be retained in the conifer plan. Discourage internally eliminated signs and commercial floodlights. However, the rest of them are regulated by our zoning resolution and prohibited. So search lights, blinking, flashing, or changing intensity lights are all prohibited by our regulations right now. So we felt that that part was covered. So the question is, do you agree with keeping part of it in and removing part of it? Do you not agree? Or do we need to work on details? Can you define what kind of signs should be? I mean, oh. Yeah, obviously I can understand what mm -hmm. you said. Is this what you want to put signs on the road? Mm -hmm. So like a box sign, a box sign that is a plastic and it has lighting behind it? Uh, it an inter one option, if you don't do internally eliminated lighting, is shining a light right at the sign, or even having backlit. So what we've seen some people do is have a sign where they have dark lettering, they have lighting behind that lettering. You can't see the light shining at you, but you can see the lettering then because of the contrast. Yeah. Well, I thought it was what I thought it was. So what about the cross going up to twenty five? They <laughs> Oh god that <laughs> Yeah, one of the things this does not apply again, this does not apply to existing development. So that is already there. And so this plan would not apply to that. Unless they wanted to come in and reason that property. Also, if somebody like had a sign in their window or decorated their house, they would only need to follow these if they were rezoning their house. Maybe they wanted to do a business or something and they wanted to put a generally eliminated sign. Or Okay, I'm going to pull, close polling soon because everybody looks like they've answered, although I've only gotten 12 responses. 
So you have like five more seconds. Okay. Okay. We have some need to work on details. Let's talk about that. I, I just saying that there's no nose. Yeah. There is no nose. We just need to work on some details. What What are the details we need to work on? Well, the question that I have is in the conifer plan, there's no um, language about special event permits. Well, it says temporary. Which you don't need a permit for. You just put it on your house or wherever. You well, businesses have lately been doing a lot of displays, like this church. Right, they don't need a permit for that. No. So what I'm saying is that the language doesn't really match very well there. Um, the time and temperature, I think, makes sense, and the temporary holiday place makes sense, but it just doesn't seem to jive with the the language in here about the permit, about the special events. And, and because I am not well versed in that, I don't know enough about what constitutes special event. But do they get permit? I'm not understanding. Where does it talk about special events? Oh, oh, approved. oh approved. Right. Unless they have been approved by special events. Oh, yeah. I see. Right. So, yeah. so that that's my problem with the two don't match. Mm -hmm. But there could be a lot more stringent in the comp plan than there are in our prior. If, yeah, and there could be. I, uh, that, there, that there was, are. That was under my, I don't know how you right. get a special event permit. I don't know what how you define and that, who gets them. And special them. events would be something that aren't covered by this plan. It's okay. So it wouldn't apply know. anyway. So uh, this plan isn't looked at when, when we review special event permits. So, um, let me see if I can make that drive in my head. So, there's a note in here that doesn't apply. <laughs> it's what you're saying. That the special event thing doesn't apply to this plan anyway. This plan would not be looked at when somebody comes in and applies for a special events permit. So, therefore, even though this kind of gives, unless approved by a special events permit, this plan, if you put language about a special events permit in this plan, it would kind of be redundant, extraneous. Extraneous. Yeah, <laughs> because we wouldn't look at it. We we don't look at this plan when we're reviewing special events permits. It wouldn't matter. Why it would not? be like that's not a nice policy to have, but yeah. we're not going to apply it. Is, is that a policy that comes from above that you don't apply this to special events? Basically, it's the interpretation that from state statute, and I'd have to look whether it's clearly spelled out in state statute or whether it's uh, an interpretation. But basically, because of state statute, it has been determined that this only applies to rezonings. It recently, the interpretation changed by a court case, just to let you know. It used to not, this plan used to not apply to special uses, and there was a recent court case that went through, and it was actually because of a case up in the Lookout Mountain area, and now comprehensive master plans do apply to special uses. Yeah, as Chris was exempted uh, from this sort of thing, I mean, yeah. we have a lot of lights here. Uh, yeah, so holiday, holiday lights. We don't need any permits. Uh, no. I would guess most special events are during the day when there's not lighting involved anyway, but things like the Confer Club putting up lights at the field for night games might start to be part of that. But if special events aren't covered with this plan, then that has to be addressed elsewhere. Yeah. Basically, special events are covered when it's over the news Correct. Okay. Policy 5. Again, this goes back to following county standards, and basically we feel that you should follow county standards at all times. So I know before there was the comment that maybe we should put, modify or put some different language in there so that people can't, shouldn't be able to go below that standard. Additionally, we do have specific language in the comprehensive master plan that talks about the abrupt changes in light levels and canopy lighting. So we felt that it could be removed. 
and maybe we need to add the language with the other language about not going below the standards. Do it. Okay, so the mountain areas are still the 12 foot and others are 20, 20 foot, is yes. that right? Yeah. So sh what Shirley was just talking about, in the zoning regulations, there's a different standard for the height of light poles. In the mountains, it is 12 feet, and in the plains, it's 20 feet. That's already in there. Yeah. In our regulations, yeah. not in the plan. It's, it's a regulation. That's kind of how I see it, is it might be a mountains plains issue. Okay, so. Let's see. Oh, shoot, that closed the polling. Oh, sorry. Okay. We have some people that do not agree. Wow. Yeah, it's nanny state. You know, gee, turn off on my own mind, essential lighting after business hours. Mm -hmm. I think that's. I mean, it's being a nanny, a nanny, um, it's overkill, you know. Hmm. So you'd like to see it removed from our No, I'd like to see it not in there, you know, help this basically in your own home, turn off all non-essential lighting, well, no, I guess if you're Bill Gates, you can care less, but it's most people, for businesses. well, even so, most businesses, are interested in making a profit, so mm -hmm. after business hours, and they would turn the lights off, and they don't need the government to tell them to turn the lights off. It always says encourage, it doesn't say. Well, even encourage is a little dumb. Like, you know, remember to wear your raincoat. Or it's raining today. <laughs> we encourage you to wear your raincoat or rain gear. I mean, at what point does the government? have to get through, drive carefully if mm -hmm. the roads are two inches of ice on them, and be careful. Well, gee, most people know you've got to be careful. Well, I know there was a statement like this also in the Evergreen Plan, and I believe it may have been that statement that got the Walmart up in Evergreen to reduce their lighting after hours, which was a big issue with the community. So there are things that can be done by the county to reduce that lighting well, impact. That um, on I can't Jason. believe they're not interested Others. in making a profit. What? You, I can't you, believe that Walmart's not interested in making a profit. 
Well, but I believe they agree to it because they don't need the lights on when it's not business hours. They don't, they don't dim they, them. Why don't they have enough brains to figure that out? Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> but they're probably making more because they do have the lights. Man yeah. overkill. It should help yeah. our operators try to turn it off. I don't have to go on, but I there's three because you said that it, at least I think you said that, that if we wanted that language put in the CMP that we should choose three. And you probably didn't register because I didn't realize when I went back to look at what the language said and explain it a little bit more, I closed polling accidentally. Oh, okay. So before everyone was done. So, okay. sorry. Say, so say that again. You Well, um, as far as putting it in the CMP, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. It is a little bit ridiculous in that everyone should know that. But... There's a lot in here that's ridiculous, and everyone should know that. So I'm not sure yeah, why, why would your body mind here? This one's especially egregious. Well, I think that as I have been out and about, not just in Colorado, but all around the country, there are huge, huge light pollution areas going on by lights on at businesses at night, and I mean, like whole, like in the, in the big high rise, whole floors of the whole building, and, you're like, and you can look in and see there's no one there, and it's ridiculous. And yeah, they should know better. But if I walk up and knock on their door and say, you're wasting money, they're not going to listen to me. And then if I say, it's also dark and we don't need all that light on, they're not going to listen to me. They might if you keep it in here. So I would say put it in the CMP. Okay. Any other questions? I don't really care if they say money or not. I care about the light pollution. So. It says encourage it. Yeah. yeah. Install only energy efficient lighting. Another duh. <laughs> <laughs> this one, we do have some policies in the comprehensive man, um, master plan that talk about encouraging well designed, energy efficient buildings that minimize energy consumption. That would relate not only to lighting, but it would also relate to other items that people might be able to do passive heating, cooling, other things maybe people could do to, to reduce energy. Also, we have another uh, standard or a policy that the county should support energy efficient building design and solar oriented site planning, so energy efficiency. And additionally, staff felt that it could be removed because even though it is not as direct and strong as the conifer language, it's really difficult for the county to enforce only energy efficient lighting. We can't, when somebody changes a light bulb, they don't have to come into the county and get a permit to change their light bulb. And therefore, somebody, if maybe we even at the beginning of the process of a commercial um, establishment, we said, install energy efficient lighting. If they change that light bulb 20 minutes later, we have no way of knowing that, and not we don't really have a way of enforcing it. So, that's what I feel. So polling is open, and I won't go back to this place. violating your standard of command versus encourage. You could say, we encourage you to install 
energy efficiency light. Here you say you shall install energy efficiency lighting. The recommendation is to remove it, though. Yeah, but the statement of what we're going to recommend on is a violation of what you said you weren't going to do. They're recommending removing it from the 285 corridor plan, and in the CMP, they can use the stronger language. Well, no, we're not going to change the CMP, right? But I don't see... Right? Yeah. I don't Install see. as a command. We're removing that language. Yeah. But that's, that's it's what's preserved somewhere else, though. Yeah. In through the other policies, we felt that the overall intent of that was preserved through the encourage well-designed energy efficiency buildings, and county should support energy efficient building design. County codes should uh, consider county codes that encourage sustainably designed and energy efficient buildings. So those are all encourage, should, and consider. Those are all words that we feel we can use in a as a recommendation. And we'd be removing the install only energy efficient lighting. So the install only energy efficient lighting is what's currently in the comfort, in the community plan. And you probably don't really, you probably don't even need to do this. I, I thinking of Walmart. I think it was last year, in all their stores around the country, they went to energy efficient mm -hmm. lighting, and they saved millions in energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you're talking about don't they want to make a profit? Well, that's other, you know, that's another way they're making a profit. They're reducing their uh, expenses. So. But I think it should say, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, moving it to the county uh, CMP language. Okay. Any other comments? And is there another section in the regulations of what the, the definition of what is energy efficient, what's the current standard? Not in, moving target. not in our regulations. Uh, I don't know if there's anything in the International Building Code. I don't know that. I was just wondering because we have definitions in the, in the you know, the light little yeah. elements and stuff like that. So I was wondering if there were definitions somewhere else. Does no, I, R -E -A know what the energy efficient? It's open up for discussion. <laughs> and I, I think it probably does keep changing yeah. because I know that as we get more energy efficient, then <clears> the <throat> things that seemed energy efficient a while back are probably not as energy efficient anymore, and so that standard might raise over time. You could say encourage the most updated energy efficient, mm -hmm. something, something like that. But what about the gold, platinum, and all these standards of build, building energy efficient building codes that are sort of at least national yeah. or maybe international? Yeah. We you could, could put that kind of language in here refer to uh, the various standards of some building that get some kind of reward. Right. Mm -hmm. That would give people an idea of well, what kind of goals are there, or these are the goals. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Just to let you know, there are also other plans in the comprehensive master plan that were not discussed in the con in the comfort plan. So I just wanted to let you know there are there are there's language in the in the comp plan that talks about minimizing the amount of light trespass associated with signs and electronic and billboard signs should not be allowed except for time and temperature devices. There's also some policies related to security lighting to keep security lighting to a minimum and using motion detector lights. And it also talks about in the comp plan encouraging lighting studies when there is a proposal before us so that we can evaluate the potential light and glare from a development proposal. Does anybody have anything else that they think is not covered that should be covered? Like things that maybe we didn't think about in the previous conifer plan that we haven't discussed in the comprehensive master plan that I've, that I've kind of let you on to know about. Okay, then we're going to move on to historic. So like I said, there are a lot of other policies in here related to air, odor, and noise, but we're not going to go through those tonight. And we may have to move kind of quickly for historic resources because we are going until 8.30 and it's 8 o'clock now. But now that you guys are familiar with this, And I'm only going to go through the 
goals of historic resources because there are a lot of goals in historic resources and they are, I felt like the goals really brought forth the biggest issues that the policies also covered. So the first goal in the Conifer Plan is preserve significant historic, archaeological, and paleontological resources for their association with events or persons, their distinctive characteristics, or the scientific data provided. Uh -huh. The comparable goal in the comp plan that staff felt already covered that is preserve, reuse, rehabilitate, or enhance historic resources that provide a link to the county's heritage while recognizing their social and economic significance for the county's future. Okay, so the question is, do you think that that is a appropriate comparison? Are, yes, if you agree, no, maybe you think that the language is perfect as is, or maybe there are some things that need some tweaking. Yeah? I just have a question, because um, I don't have Google in front of me right now. Paleontological. Dinosaurs? Well, I mean... What, I mean, define that. I don't have Google in front of me. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I suspect that's something to do with paying the Yeah. Yeah. So it would be prehistoric type of right. fossil yeah. 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 Okay. fossils. Yeah. Leaves, up here fossils, dinosaur bones. Yeah. Well, does the historic resource mean that well, does the historic resources category cover that as a sub? Okay, that's all I was Yeah, saying. so what we did when I we defined, we didn't. When we did the comprehensive master plan, we didn't want to keep repeating historic, right, exactly. archaeological, and paleontological, right. and some plans even said cultural resources. It's really a mouthful, so we just, we, in the comprehensive master plan, for words that are defined, it's not the bold and italic like it is in conifer, but anything that right. is capitalized, we have a definition. And where do I find what's underneath the word historical resources? In the glossary of the comprehensive master plan. Yeah. Okay, so I know we lost a couple of people, so anybody else that wants to vote, do so now. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought I lost somebody else too. She didn't move. Okay. So we have some, uh, uh, looks like a no, and a couple need to work on details. So let's talk about what those details are that we might So what about geological resources? I want to say that we may have defined that as historic resources. I could be wrong, but let's well, write that out there. I would say it'd be closer to paleontological mm -hmm. than historical. Yeah. Well, and we... So rocks and outcrops. Geologists need to look at rocks, and if you're going to seed over okay. a highway exposure that might be the world's only exposure of something, well, that's not preserving, or that's sort of obliterating mm -hmm. a geological resource. She, those types of resources, so outcroppings or any sort of significant feature, would be covered by the policies in our visual resources section. We can well, see I mean, if you can't see resources. a paleontological resource, you can't see the dinosaur tracks, that is not a visual resource. Right. So it's a paleontological resource, yeah. So okay. I would say uh, if you seed it over Dinosaur Ridge, well, then you would be destroying, it wouldn't be a visual resource, it would be a, you don't have any way of preserving dinosaur ridge. And somebody could say, well, they want to seed over and grass over everything on dinosaur ridge. Actually, yeah. I'm a geologist, so <laughs> I will respond to, to that concern, and I would like to see the language on the historic the definition, because I think you bring up a very good point. Paleontology is specific to fossil evidence, but I mean there are, there are other geological features that are not paleontology. So, does the definition of historic in, in the comprehensive master plan provide for other geologic features that really are historic? I mean, the fact that you've got 1.7 billion year old rocks out there to me that's historic. Yeah. It's not paleontological, but it is, you know, there's, yeah, there's no provision for the conservation <laughs> and preservation. So 
of geological resources. So maybe it could be broadened in the definition of historical, but it's not just paleontological, paleontological. The ice age road cut is an incredible geological mm -hmm. resource, yeah. and it's in danger of being somewhat destroyed, and there's no provision uh, to preserve it. But there's a whole chapter on visual, right? There's a whole chapter and on visual. And would it resources. not be considered visual? It goes beyond no. the, the no. visual, so, because it's that, educational, think, it's historical. Yeah. Yeah. So you, but if you, you have, have not uh, included an important... That's why I asked what was under history. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, Unless you want to call it Earth history, but most people well, don't consider the history of the Earth mm -hmm. as a geologist the same thing as history of human yeah. beings. Well, however, what she was saying is that that's their intent with the language of historic is that it does span paleontological, which opens the door to spanning history of the Earth. Is it going broad enough to include... I think, I think you need to include... <laughs> Historic, archaeological, and paleontological, and geologic resources you've left out. In the a very important thing, and I'm going to propose all kinds of historical sites on your, on your <laughs> historic <laughs> locations that are really important to the history of geology and the science of geology. Okay, I'll need to so, look into the definition yeah. of the uh, paleontological. You could include that, say, ge paleontological is a subset of geological resources. I'll have to look into what the I definition would, says because I don't remember. As a geologist, remember, I would say it's, it's, that's a, a, a small subset of geological resources. And Annalise was going to say something about our current regulations that may, I don't know if it would help you guys. Yeah, um, and I'll, then I'll let the woman in the back also. Um, so separate from the comprehensive master plan, um, there's subdivision platting processes. So if someone has a 30-acre parcel, um, and they already have the zoning in place to subdivide that parcel, maybe into five-acre pieces, they have to go through a subdivision plat process, and as a standard requirement of the um, subdivision plat process, and this is a regulation, not a plan recommendation, they are required to submit a historical, archaeological, paleontological, um, geologic report that is more comprehensive than even the plan here, and that's where a licensed geologist, a licensed engineer, whatever is appropriate to that specific plan has to submit, and that's a regulatory piece of um, piece of the process. So I just, I just want to say it's not being thrown out the window. It is already in play and heavily looked at. Um, it's just in not at the time of rezoning, it's the time of actual development when we're creating those lot lines. There's rock outcroppings, they need to be clearly delineated on the plat document. Those are defined as no build areas, etc. So, um, so why don't you put geological on here? So and we got that down. Yeah. Yeah. In, we'll in listening to the concerns, I think that that's the point that's being made is somewhere either in the definition of what historic or paleontology, what is included in that? either needs to include geological or in the verbiage we need to see it added. But most people don't know the difference between archaeological and paleontological. When you say you're a geologist, oh, you're hunting for areas. Well, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, well, we can't um, educate everyone. So yeah. by adding so it, I by think adding it geological, then you have to say, gee, there must be a difference. But adding it under the historical yeah. resources. And it's and, important. And I mean, it's it's important important to business more. and I may and need to talk to you guys more about what, Ridge and what exactly the distinction is. I-70 and the Triceratops Trail sure and the we, Colorado School of Ice the Trail and all these geological features here are a major, potential major tourist and business yeah. destinations and uh, you don't even include it in your discussion. So that's a very fundamental uh, wrongheadedness point in your uh, resource management plan. It needs to be put into the comprehensive countywide end each of the local areas, so you've totally left out an important category. Okay. Heather, I'd like to make a suggestion for if, you know, for taking it out of the community plan. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add um, the, you know, the, the historic resources that provide a link to the counties and or local areas resources. Oh. Because when you're talking, you know, counties, maybe the local something in Conifer wouldn't get on that list of county. Okay. But to the local area, it's really important. That seems like an easy one. Good one. So I, I guess I'd make the, the suggestion that, you know, that can be removed if all those terms are included in the kind of definition of historic in the glossary of the CMP. If that can't be changed or modified, then we keep it in. 
Okay. Well, and right and now, I no, know that his, historic resources are defined and include archaeologic and paleontological. Right now, the geologic is not in the conifer plan, and I'm not sure if that's in there. I know that geologic was included in some other of our community plans, and so it might be in that definition. So what's dinosaur ridge included on as? It is included as a historic resource. It's um, in the Central Plains community plan. Well, you've even misclassified that. It's not a historic. It's geological. Yeah, it's it, well, because we, we don't want to say... But you didn't have a category for geology, so yeah. you had to say, oh, it's historic. But nobody in their right mind is going to call dinosaur ridge a historic site. We were trying to generalize because we didn't want to say every time archaeologic, paleontologic, and geologic resources. So, yeah. And I know that there's a distinction there, but we're trying to make sure that we cover all of them and, I guess, decrease our word count. So, speaking of word count, <laughs> so the, the reason that I said three, um, I mean, this has all been fascinating. I'm, interesting with two geologists in the room. Do we have any historical society people in the room? You? Okay, so Grace, so here's the question for you, because I don't do that, but my layman's interpretation of it is that there's a big distinction between the word preserve, which is the conifer plant word, and that's the only word, preserve, versus all of their other words, which is besides preserve reuse, rehabilitate, or enhance. And I'm wondering, as a person who's not involved in that at all, if a historical society type of person or group would take issue with the different language there. Because there's leave it alone preserve versus all the sort of changing words that are in the CMP. And, and we, we in Truthfully, we intentionally have some of those other words in there because there may, it may not always be the best thing to do to completely preserve the site. There may be other things that may allow somebody to do something different to the site, and maybe they can either um, restore. Restore. restore it, maybe they can do an addition to it and make that addition look like it's within the historic character. Maybe they can move it to a different portion of the site. Maybe they right. can reuse, I know that um, I was talking to the person that's on our, that is our historic commission liaison, and he said there may be an opportunity for people to, even if, they, say, they need to demolish the structure, maybe it's in such bad shape, there's not a way to restore it um, appropriately. They maybe can use some of the wood from it and put that into their new development and reuse some of the features. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe use some of the old signage. Maybe use um, some of those features that were on there. So we, truthfully, we intentionally broadened that. Yes. Yeah, I think I basically like that idea. I think it broadens the opportunities and options and preserve is. I'm not even quite sure what that means. Right. So. And then the word restore, though, is interestingly not here. Is there a reason for that? Rehabilitate. Oh, rehabilitate would be the same as restore, then? Yeah. Okay. I guess one, you, know, you bring up a really good point, because I can think of a really egre example of an egregious abuse of uh, reusing was when they uh, allowed casino gambling in Cripple Creek in Central City. Mm -hmm. It was all the guys to... to renovate those little historic mining towns and they all said well we're gonna you know go back to what the city you know restore all the stuff they completely wiped out the character yeah, exactly. of those mining towns under the guise of <laughs> the mask of the yeah 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 and I think that would I think you bring up the point that they're and I don't know how you address that kind of abuse and that's it's all about big money. That's yeah, big money to that. Maybe that's not a word of concern here, but you know, how do you keep yourself on guard for? Yeah, that was too bad. What happened to Cripple Creek? Oh yeah, and yeah. Central City and Blackhawk. And people voted, uh, voted that in, thinking that oh, this is well, that's the point. That's the point that you you can stop it if you can convince mm -hmm. enough people. No. Yeah, yeah. So historical two. 
promote restoration and interpretation of and education about historic, archaeological, and paleontological resources. There were a few policies that staff felt got to the, the intent of it, and it's it's a little, maybe a little difficult to find it here. So there is promote, let's see, when we talk about promoting the education about, there is a language that talks about promoting the existing benefits and exploring new incentives that would encourage developers to protect and integrate historic resources. We felt that fit into education because we would, it talks about promoting benefits, which kind of is like educating. There is also a policy that talks about partnering with nonprofits to acquire funding to provide educational opportunities. So that more directly talks about education. And then there is a policy that talks about encouraging acquisition, preservation, and management of historic resources, which is what we felt got to the promote restoration, and in, uh, not the interpretation part. I think we felt this got to the interpretation part, but more of the restoration, encouraging acquisition, preservation, and management of those. So this one is a little tricky, and so I really want to hear your feedback as to whether those policies do cover this. So we can start voting. So we have a lot of no's. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that CMP language is mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. I just don't see the strength that's in in the, the, the area okay. for the plan. It just takes. <laughs> it's almost encouraging developers to kind of engulf whatever that is and try to throw it in there somewhere. I thought. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, I said um, three because I really felt like the CMP language couldn't live on its own. I didn't have a problem with it per se, except if it lives on its own, because then it is too vague. It, it's almost like it belongs as a, you need the conifer language. Like, you know, to seek alternatives that would, oh, sorry, I'm on the line. Uh, promote restoration and interpretation, blah, 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 you know, in these ways. Without, yeah, uh, you see, I agree. It's yeah, like they, they need to go together. The content of the CMP should be the bullets supporting the conifer plan yes. for the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that the uh, CMP was much more powerful because it was more direct and indicated what to do. Work with not for profit, acquire. Right. I thought the conifer language was vague mm. and could be totally interpreted. I mean, that, that was that's why I voted yes. So it sounds like the conifer language, maybe we should consider putting that into the comprehensive master plan that. as a goal. Yes. 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 There you go. And that then would having those yeah. under it as policies yeah. Yeah. that would implement yeah. that goal. Yeah. Right. That I was the Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Historical three, seek alternatives that would avoid major alterations, physical destruction, or relocation. So, we have, oh, whoops, I'm sorry. So, oh, I didn't start holding up, so we're, there's policy, there's a policy in the plan, and I, there's more language underneath it, so there's more to it on your, on your sheet, but it's starting to get really small. So, promote the county's heritage by encouraging new development to integrate significant historic resources into development plans, site designs, and architectural details. Now, I know that that doesn't specifically say seek alternatives, but it says it, it's a policy and there's more to it. Basically, the policy says, okay, first, somebody, when they come in for development, we need to encourage them to integrate 
their, that historic resource into the development plan. Then the rest of this policy talks about when it is not feasible to integrate the historic resource without it being altered beyond its significance, the historic significance. So first, you integrate it into the, the, um, the development. If it is not feasible to do that, then the following recommendations are listed in order of preference. First, you need to notify the Jefferson County Historic Commission and other state and local historic agencies for proper care and handling of the resource. Then, you would need to provide documentation of the significant historic resource to the Historic Commission, doesn't quite say that in there, before there's any alteration or demolition of the resource. When possible, relocate that existing, that significant historic resource on or off of the site, and then integrate the historic context of the site resource into the new development even if the significance is altered. So that last what is like taking the materials from the building and incorporating them into the new development in some way, maybe using the boards as fence posts or using the signage or using the wood in some community center or something like that. So that is some language where we felt like it was a little more specific than what the conifer plan said and that it covered that. Yes, no, need to work on details. More let me vote. He's telling me I can't vote. We've been banned? No. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Must be time to go. Yeah. Let's <laughs> 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 see. <laughs> yeah. Voted for. Are the slides are already there? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, great. Great. <laughs> it's already in PowerPoint. I <laughs> 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 we thought we were having some input. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> Still there. I'm a journalist, so I look at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. on this one, sorry, you'll need to, we'll need to just discuss this one. We don't get to have the results, I'm sorry. <laughs> so all for number one. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the, the local plan, the kind of the plan, mm -hmm. and how we can incorporate, or if it's already incorporated in the master plan, right? right. But, uh, like that, move this, move this into comp plan as goal, like the last one we discussed. Can language be suggested at this meeting that could go over there? Yes. Okay, then, okay. then I do have something to talk about. I am a controversial, but okay. even though I am representing the paper, uh, Park County paper. I provide documentation of the city. Is there something deeper than this? Like, it's got to be professionals that, that document. Mm -hmm. Understand what I'm saying? Provide documentation of the city. I'm sorry, I'm so before we go. What? Is, is that done by academics, professionals, archaeologists? I mean, or is, is somebody just just write down, like, you know, this is my grandmother's place and it's been here for 150 years. I mean, in Israel, and this is not a, this is not a, this is a, this is a, this is a preservation thing. I'm not, a, I'm not going, in Israel, I mean, there is all sorts of, uh, Things that have to be documented, pictures. I mean, there's all kinds of sort of rules, and I'm, I don't like a lot of rules, but that's the only way you can get something like this properly documented. You've got to stop. You've got if it's going to if it's going to go bye bye. There's there's certain things that have to be done. Is that if is there deeper information that's not here or somewhere in another county document or something? Because this seems yeah. way wide open. This says I could just sit down, write yeah. something up about it, and I hand it to the county, the county says, yeah, that looks fine. That could probably be clarified more. What, just to let you know, what typically happens right now is that when somebody wants to demolish something that's on the property or alter it, there's a referral that goes to the Jefferson County Historical Commission, 
and then they look at it and they give, if they want to get documentation of it, they give the developer or applicant certain standards of how they would like to see it documented. But that's not, that's not specifically laid out here. That it's, I mean, it does say the first preference is notify the historic commission for proper care and right, handling, right, right. and then um, it could it could talk about somehow the. Well, I'd like to know what the Kansas County Historic Commission considers proper documentation. Do they tell the developer to go find a geologist, or archaeologist, paleontologist, a little of all of them, and this I, needs yeah. to be documented this way, and pictures need to be taken, and you know, I mean. Um, so, so the, the archaeological or paleontological evidence is not lost, it's a history? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't like know. know. Yeah, I don't know what their standards are. We'd have to go Well, there's a statutory definition of a pro professional geologist in the Colorado State statutes. Well, okay, I'm not... I'm so, I mean, that's... It's statutorily defined what is a professional geologist. So if they say you're a professional geologist... Well, that's what I'm asking. Do they uh, say yeah. things like that? Well, I don't know. that, But there is yeah. a statutory yeah. definition. Well, I'm not worried. Definitions okay. of other professional I standards. understand. I'm not talking about... But if your grandfather lived there in the cabin and he related stuff to you, I would say that would be... Well, that would be the <coughs> documentation, but if the, let's say that cabin's going to be taken away. Do you have... Is the historic society asking you bring in a professional that's going to properly document that, maybe somebody, that, you know, down to the level of discussing the kind of construction, somebody's, somebody, the, the, the methods of construction stuff, or do you, do you just have, you know? Well, if somebody's going to oppose your zoning request, I'd say you'd have to have a professional documentation to when defend your position. We do have certain standards in our land development regulation that applies to subdivisions, so when somebody does a subdivision, they are required to do a historic report or plan, and in that document it says who should be re uh, preparing that report. That's the sort of what I'm talking about. Who yeah. should be, who okay. should be preparing the this documentation? Yeah. Is that there is no requirement of a certain level of professional to do that documentation, whereas in previous slides we talked about how they had to have a certified engineer, for instance. So I think there's some concern around there's no level of professional required to do that documentation. That's right. You may have said yeah. that to me. I think that's where they're both getting at, but yeah. I don't think they're yeah. getting there in the same direction. Well, proper probably means so what professional is the documentation. So so do that that just means they're making proper documentation. Yeah, basically. I don't know. We're earlier encouraged to make make. So, uh, language is, be yeah, Pro proper just seems ambiguous to me. Um, where it's been defined previously, I'd like to see more definition. Well, and it may be defined, uh, yes. you know, under the historical societies. Yes. I I'm just curious. That, that's how I don't know. Well, and it is 830, which is what I said was the, was what the meeting went to. We can stick around and do more. Or we can, I can ask, or we can stop and you can give me your comments on these. Or you can just go, we can start doing the, look at your historic maps and let us know if there's any additional um, resources. It sounds like we have definitely somebody who's going to have comments on that. Um, I just have one quick one. So I don't know if anybody wants to stay, but you're, I mean, you're definitely allowed, you definitely can give me comments over the next month, I'd say until our next meeting, September 25th, you can definitely give me comments on all of these.